the Joe Rogan experience. Are you anticipating seeing like a lot of freaky things come out of China? Yes. Whoa. You said that very quick. Yeah, no, it's true. I, <laughs> no, I spend I spend a lot of time in China. I, I, I and and this it's a different. I mean, the thing with China, China has this great ancient civilization, but they destroyed their own civilization in the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. They they burned their books. They smashed their own um, historic relics. And so it's really, it's a society in many ways that's starting from scratch. And so all of these norms that people get inherit through their traditions, China in many ways doesn't have. And wow. so, and so it's, it's a very different, and, and China is growing. I mean, they are increasingly powerful and China is going to be a major force, force defining the world of, of the 21st century. That's why America has to get its act together. That's a hard concept for us to grasp when we think about the fact that they had the Great Wall, yeah. they have so much ancient art and architecture. Yeah. We just assume they're a really old culture. They are, but they but wiped it out. That's so yeah. crazy. That's, yeah. a, that's, that's a why if you want to see if you want to see great Chinese art, you have to go to Taiwan because when the Chinese nationalists left in 1949, when they lost, uh, as they were losing the civil war, they took the treasures and they put them in the National Museum of Taiwan. In the, the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, China, the Red Guards were just smashing all of their own stuff, their own ancient history. And now, now the Chinese Communist Party is saying, oh no, we're going back and we have this great 5,000 year old culture and in some ways it's true but in some ways it's like an adolescent culture without these kinds of restrictions that other societies have that's such a unique perspective that i haven't heard before and it makes so much sense yeah. in terms of like how frantic they are at restructuring yeah. their world yeah yeah and and they feel that they got screwed over because there is this this vague this sense of chinese greatness when you hear the word middle kingdom it's mm -hmm. like china's the center of the world and everybody else is some kind of, of tributary and so they're monumentally pissed off that these colonial powers came and overpowered them and they had to make all these concessions. They had to give land away and, and hell bent on regaining, regaining it. it. They're playing the long yeah, game. They are playing a long game. And, and we have not. to be, and we are not, and we have to be mindful of it. That's also something you can do if you have complete control of your population and you don't have to worry about people's opinions or you can just yeah. go in the direction that you feel yeah. is going to benefit the Chinese power, yeah. the power that be. Well, it, it, this is a country run by engineers. We, yeah. we, we're a country run largely by lawyers and, and, and reality TV people, I guess. Yeah. Um, but in China, it's run by engineers. So there are all these problems and the answer is always engineering. So you, if you have a population wow. problem, it's the answer is the one child policy. Environmental problem, you have Three Gorges Dam. You don't have water in the north of China. You build this massive, biggest water project in the world from south to north. You want to win in the Olympics, you engineer your population, you take kids away from their families and put them in their Olympic sports school. So I write about this in, in Genesis Code. If you're China and you kind of have this Plato's Republic model of the world and we're going to kind of identify the genetic or maybe manipulate these genetic superstars to be our greatest scientists and mathematicians and business leaders and political leaders, like there's a model that you can imagine for, for how to do it. Wow. It makes you really nervous. It should. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing. No, it's like, that's why. Like I just feel like with this country, we don't have time to have all these distractions. We're focusing on junk. Like what? It just like all of this, you know, I'm on CNN all the time when I'm, when I'm home in New York. And I always say like you guys, and I'm talking about kind of geopolitical issues, China and, and North Korea. What I always say is like, you guys recognize this is porn. Like CNN and, and MSCB, that's like one kind of porn and Fox and, and whomever else, Infowars, that's another kind of porn. But it's all porn. And we're just kind of, we're drawing people's attention to these few stories. But there's these big stories that we have to focus on. And, and certainly the rise of China is such an essential story for the 21st century because China is competing in all of these technologies. And China, it's like, go, go, go. I mean, people in China who are involved in the tech world, when they go and, and visit Silicon Valley, uniformly, they say, we cannot believe these people are so lazy. Like, why are they not working 24 hours a day? Why are they not <sighs> issuing product, new products every, uh, every week? And so this is, I mean, they are racing somewhere and it's going to have huge implications for the world. And so if we believe in our values, as I believe we should, we have to fight for them. And the place that we have to fight for them first is here. And yeah. we can't, you know, it's just like every day that we're just focusing on this, 
this drama, this reality TV drama of our government is another day where we're not focusing on the big things. How are we going to get our act together? How are we going to lead the world in technology? I mean, if another example is this is immigration. Like we have this whole fight of how do we keep people out? What I'd like to do is to go to, to the State Department and say, all right, every embassy in the world, you have a new job. You have to, we're going to give you whatever a number, 500 slots per year. You have to, in your country, find the 500 most brilliant, talented, creative, entrepreneurial people and say, we're giving you a green card. We're going to give you a little starter money. We want you to move to the United States and just start a life and have kids. And if we, we, we should be creaming the crop, skimming the cream of the rest of the world. And like we could take over, we, we could revitalize this country, but we're having this fight of, how do we keep a small number of refugees out? And it's just, we're not focusing on the right things. That's, a, that's again, another very, very interesting perspective. We, are, we learned about Huawei in this country, yeah. really, but not just, well, I learned about it because they put out some pretty innovative phones and right. some interesting technology. But we learned it because the State Department was telling people to right. stop using their phones. Yep. Do you think that that is trying to stifle the competition? Like to try, like because yeah. the market share that they have, if they do really have yeah. num the number two selling cell phones in the world now, right. that's not from America. America is right. largely out of that conversation. Right. And if they were in America, they would probably dominate in America as well because they're cheaper. Yeah, and they're yeah. really good. Yeah, I mean, they they yeah. their phones are insane. Their yeah. the cameras in their phones are yeah. off the charts. Yep. they they put some video of the the zoom capability mm -hmm. of their newest phone, and people were calling bullshit. There's like, there's no way that's not even yeah. possible. But it yeah. it turned out it yeah. was true. Yeah, they really can. It really can zoom yeah. like an, a super expensive telephoto lens. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So Huawei. It's a complicated story. For sure, the founder of Huawei is a former Chinese military right. officer. For sure, For sure, in the early stages of their company, they stole, straight out stole lots of source code from companies like Cisco. Um, for sure, we should be really worried if um, Huawei is the sole supplier of the infrastructure that supports 5G all around the world because the Chinese government would have access to everything. And so that leads us to the question is one, is there a problem with Huawei itself? Um, and, but then two is let's just say, and, I, and so I think the answer to that first question is probably yes. Um, but then the question two is let's just say Huawei is a legit company and they're not totally intimately connected uh, to the Chinese government. Can we trust their relationship with the Chinese government? And the Chinese government has a rule that every one of these companies has the, the big Chinese national companies, national champion companies, they have a communist party cell inside of that company. And so these, like, I think that we can't think of big Chinese companies just like we think of companies here. We have to think of them as quasi-state actors. And that's why this, wow. this fight that's happening right now is, is, is so important. And that's why, like, when China is out investing in different parts of the world, including Africa, their companies are kind of acting like arms of the government. I mean, they're making all kinds mm. of investments that don't really make sense if you just see, well, this is a company doing something. If you say that this is a company with backing by the state that's fulfilling a function that supports the state, it's, it's, just, it's a very different model. So I, I am actually quite concerned about, uh, about Huawei, and, and I'm not a fan of everything that this administration is doing, but I think on, on China, it's important that we, we need to stand up. And I think pushing back on Huawei is the right thing to do. I'm uncomfortable about this for two reasons. One, I'm uncomfortable about that, about the Chinese government being inexorably connected yeah. to this global superpower in technology. Right. But I'm also uncomfortable that it sets a precedent for other nations to follow yeah. because they're like, look, this is the only way to compete. Because what right. you were talking about, the investments that Huawei right. or that the Chinese government makes in these other, yeah. these countries and that don't seem to make sense if you're just dealing with a right. company. Right. But if you're dealing with someone yeah. who's trying to take over the world, yeah. it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and, so, so, and so when we have our companies that you're out in some place in Africa and you're competing with a Chinese company on to do something, build a port or whatever, yeah. and you're competing because you are an American company. And so you have your calculus, all right, this is the port, what's the income stream going to be about it? And you have a certain amount that you can bid because otherwise it becomes a bad investment. Mm. But if the Chinese company is that, their calculus is not, is this a good or bad investment? It's what is the state interest 
in controlling or quasi controlling this asset. And so that's why we can't project ourselves onto the Chinese. We can't say they're just like us, right. just different. It's, it, we have different models and our models are competing. Do you think that we should avoid Huawei products like consumers should? I, well, I think the government should very tightly regulate um, products like uh, Huawei products. Because some they, of their network, uh, like routers, yeah, or, exactly. they've shown that they, they're they using them to yes, extract yeah. information. And so the, we've, we have a long history of European, Japanese, South Korean companies that have invested very well. They've outcompeted us. And we've, uh, we've allow, we allowed the Japanese uh, companies to outcompete our auto manufacturers. And that was, that was fine in the sense it, our, in the 1970s, our cars had become shit mm -hmm. because we had this monopoly. And so I'm all for open competition. I'm all for free trade. It has to be fair. But I think that what China is doing, China recognized as a state that they could use the tools of capitalism to achieve state ends. And I think we need to be very cautious about that. Mm, that's interesting that you compare it to the automotive market because the consequences are so much different, right? So much different because- But we do have a model to go on. We could see yeah. what happened. We, did, we made shitty cars, the Japanese took over. Yeah. And then we made better cars. Like yes. I, I have a rental car here um, in Los Angeles. And I went to the, to the, um, the rental car place at, at LAX and they had all of the different cars. And there was like a, a Nissan and a Toyota, and there was a Cadillac. And for the first, I thought, you know, I said, I'm going to go with the Caddy. Hmm. So it's a great car. And so oh, I think they're amazing. They're incredible. Yeah, um, American cars are very good now. They're great. Yeah. And, and so like, I'm all for competition, but I just feel like what Chinese, some Chinese companies are doing, it's not competition. It's they have become, not all of them, but quasi-state actors. And mm. if that's what they're doing, I think we need to respond to them in that way. Interesting. <laughs>